further ado, our next speaker is going to be Tobias Bertel from the University of Bath. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, konnichiwa. Uh, my name is Tobias Bertel, and I'm going to talk about Mega Parallax, Casual 360 Panoramas with Motion Parallax. So the main motivation for our project is to investigate casual pipelines for the creation of VR content and experience. Um, and every casual pipeline must contain some handheld capturing procedure, uh, hopefully with a consumer camera. And the current state of the art for this um, is built on omnidirectional stereo methods, which purposefully or by construction remove all motion parallax from uh, the representation so you don't get uh, translational feedback um, while experiencing. Um, and what we're doing is uh, make, a make a parallax, so we basically apply image-based rendering on an omnidirectional stereo setup, and we are able to produce high-quality depth perception in terms of motion parallax. Um, since our method is based on IBR, I want just to uh, give a rough overview of what I mean by this. So every IBR method has a representation and a rendering step. The representation in general uh, contains of images you capture casually in some sense. Um, you need to know from uh, like how and from where these images were captured. And optionally, you can establish geometric uh, relations among these images. So they can be either implicit in terms of optical flow or explicit in terms of global scene geometry. The rendering itself uh, can always uh, can be boiled down to uh, ray reconstruction. Like for every individual ray, camera ray of the desired viewpoint, you want to reconstruct the color which is traveling along this ray. Um, in general, IBR methods uh, can be categorized um, among or according to the geometry which is used in rendering, which is nothing but ray reconstruction. And we see here um, some methods which don't rely on any geometry. So they have in common that you read that you capture a very dense set of input images. And uh, rendering is just uh, basically linearly interpolating rays from a dense database. Implicit methods, on the other hand, work on sparser input uh, images or sparser sets of input images. And re ray reconstruction becomes uh, more difficult. And um, all these methods have in common that they use some kind of flow-based guidance during ray reconstruction. And explicit methods um, rely on some global scene geometry and um, yeah, which is usually hard to obtain for general uh, environments. And I mentioned here the unstructured Lumi graph since it's a common paper or a common uh, method uh, people benchmark or compare with when they come up with a new IBR method. Our method, Mega Parallax, can be seen as a combination of casual omnidirectional stereo and image-based rendering. So to get you a feel of what we're doing, so here you see um, handheld um, video, captured video handheld, and uh, note the uh, wobbly camera path. Now we process the data set and now compare um, yeah, three methods. So you see on the right, our approach is able to produce motion parallax and creating smooth um, output results, while Mega Stereo has a flat appearance and ULR um, yeah, creates blurry artifacts. Here we see that our approach, compared to Parallax 360, is able to um, create a wider field of view in the output views, than it, um, which is represented or which is given in, um, in the input images. Our pipeline consists of uh, basically four big boxes, and we start with the capture, right? Um, so in general, we always record a video on a circular trajectory, a handheld, that's my office, by the way. Um, and what we see or what we get, yeah, we have a wobbly trajectory because it's handheld and the capturing speed is not constant or human factors. Then in our pre-processing, the first step we do um, is like, okay, we capture the video frames from the capture, right? Now we subsample these frames and perform a sparse reconstruction using CallMap. And now we register all remaining frames to the sparse reconstruction. And then optionally you can perform another step of global bundle adjustment. The data set creation itself, so we computed sparse reconstruction, we get extrinsics from uh, ComUp, which contain optical centers depicted as the black dots here. Uh, we fit a circle to these centers and now register all viewpoints we captured according to the circle. So this gives basically a unique polar angle uh, to each individual viewpoint. And then we establish correspondences between pairs of images in terms of optical flow. Uh, to recap, so basically, oh, excuse me. So from the, from the reprocessing, we get a set of calibrated images between two and 400. We have a circle, right? We fitted the circle and the bidirection optical flow per neighboring image pair. Uh, for rendering, we use a plane as proxy geometry, like the simplest, uh, thing, you, uh, the simplest thing you can think of. Um, this uh, plane is always um, is attached to the desired viewpoint, 
and can be seen as like a billboard or it's always parallel to the virtual image plane. <clears throat> so in terms of rendering, so imagining, okay, we have uh, given our viewpoint, we have the planar scene geometry, um, and now OpenGL rasterizes this proxy and we get for each desired ray in our desired viewpoint uh, some scene point X. Now from the circle and from the registration of the viewpoints, we can easily look up a camera pair which is enclosing, which basically observes this point X. We project this scene point into, this, uh, into the camera pair and now linearly interpolate uh, the color of values in these pixels. How this uh, blending weight alpha is determined, we see here. So um, given we have uh, this desired viewpoint, we have the desired ray, we intersect the desired ray with the camera trajectory or with the camera circle and uh, can determine the pair by this. Now we connect the optical centers of these three uh, viewpoints, like uh, depicted with these arrows, and compute relative angles between them. And the final blending weight is nothing but a ratio between these uh, angles. It's quite simple, isn't it? Right. Um, so now, since our method is implicit, we, we use a flow-based blending um, just to motivate this a little bit. So um, assuming that our scene geometry is well approximated by the proxy, there's not much to do, right? Everything is fine. Uh, we can have a cup of tea. But usually what you have, like, yeah, the real world is like, okay, you have uh, closer objects and you see now that um, the, the, project, uh, the point projected from the actual real object projects into different places in, in the images. And what we do, we basically perform um, yeah, some flow adjustment to push, this, to push these initially proxy projected points, XL and XR, towards these uh, new points, and we call these uh, flow compensated image coordinates. If you're, more, if you're interested how this works in, in detail, please uh, have a look at our paper. Um, we compare um, with a few methods, so we see um, ULR needs the explicit uh, geometry, which is usually hard to obtain for general cases. Mega stereo does not offer uh, motion parallax, and viewing space is restricted to viewing circle. Um, parallax 360, if the capture is done uh, using a robot, and the actual synthesis happens on the sampling sphere, which comes down to view interpolation. And our method um, yeah, is based on a casual I mean, stereo setup. It delivers motion parallax, and we can explicitly define uh, desired viewpoints within the circle. And one big advantage is that for our rendering, we don't rely on explicit geometry. So it's much easier to come up with implicit um, geometry. Um, as comparison to Parallax 360, so whenever you have a desired viewpoint, you just take the central ray of the desired viewpoint to determine the output image, while we are um, yeah, using basically a per-ray synthesis. And the effect of this but you see here on the right, as we go forward and backward, we, see we get different perspectives since we will sample or look, look up different camera pairs per ray. And Parallax 360 gives basically a static or constant perspective. Um, the same way if we translate uh, left and right, so we uh, use the per pixel synthesis, um, we see here that our approach can basically create a wider field of view uh, for input uh, um, as output views. Right, according to viewing space. So what we're interested in is uh, basically how much can we move within this captured ring. So usually we, the, our handheld capture is usually this uh, radius, like 0.8 meters, and now we are interested how far we can move our head in this space, all right? And uh, we found out that this is basically limited by the field of view and the circle radius, all right? And just to motivate this, so basically we have, um, let's say, some limited field of view in the input images. And we see here that the central ray um, which gives the camera pair depicted in orange and blue, um, is asking for a direction which is not uh, covered by the, blue, uh, by the blue viewpoint. So what this causes, we see basically here, so uh, I downsampled the number of images on the circle, and you see basically as soon you come close to the actual border of your, of your camera circle, you ask for a direction which not exists in the camera pair, and you basically get um, a black pixel back. Okay. Yes, you could circumvent this just by using wider field of use input images. So imagine you don't capture just with a, whatever, like your standard consumer camera, but you have like a 360 mono camera, uh, and then you don't have this issue that, you know, you ask for directions which don't exist. Um, 
discussion-wise. So like, a, few, a few things I want to mention which were important uh, or hopefully interesting for most of you. So for the capture, it's good to have a wide field of view, like the wider the better, and um, use a high frame rate since you can always in the pre-processing sample your frames, right? From the pre-processing, so we used um, structural motion, off-the-shelf structure for motion, like Comap, and um, yeah, it's known that they struggle um, with narrow baseline, inside-out captures, and uh, I don't know how, many, how much time uh, we spend actually f f figuring out the right parameters to get come up with something. Um, and actually, there's a poster here at IEEE VR, which deals with this, um, by Lewis Baker at all, ID 072. So if you're interested in just this pre-processing, check this out, please. Um, Representation-wise, so we've seen in the talk before, layer geometry is a very popular way, I would say, at the moment to um, uh, represent scene geometry. But yeah, it's very hard to, to find general solutions to this, right? So it really depends on your scene, how close objects are, how dynamic your scene is, is there non-rigid uh, non elements in, in the scene? And our ODS setup, uh, on the other hand, has a very bulky representation. So we have lots of images between 200 and 400, right? Additionally, flow between the images. Um, so it's yeah, quite consuming in a memory uh, manner. But the, the obvious um, advantage of it is like we don't have to model visibility or occlusion explicitly. Right? And the rendering itself, so we use implicit IVR on casual uh, ODS, uh, on a casual ODS setup. And uh, yeah, actually, the idea is rather straightforward. And, like, it's uh, very simple, actually. Um, yeah, we perform an explicit per array synthesis, which is um, yeah not given in ODS uh, in the ODS ROM, and um, yeah the method is very fast. So it comes down to um, yeah looking up textures more or less. So the only thing we have to compute are intersections with the circle. It's uh, very straightforward. And the main limitations of the method is like a restricted viewing space and vertical distortion. What I mean by this, you can see here. So like the restricted viewing space, we are always restricted to this circle we fitted, or the plane, right, we are looking in. And uh, here we overlay a um, uh, reconstructed point cloud from Comap, and we see here basically the like this effect of vertical distortion. Like our result is down there, and it should be up there, right? <laughs> but this is very well known since uh, the rendering uh, with concentric mosaic paper of Schum et al. And this is basically the most uh, limiting factor. So we are working on how to get better geometry or in these setups. Yes, uh, all right. So I want to conclude my talk by thanking quite a lot of uh, different uh, institutes and people, and especially want to emphasize on the Rebin Estra scholarship, which I got very early stage in my uh, PhD. And uh, yeah, I want to conclude by taking your questions, and I let some results play in the background, which didn't make it into the talk. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. Uh, I can get us started. Um, do you have any thoughts about how to extend this to handle video? Mm, well, well. So, so the, the, the problem is um, that the video, like, like the, the common commercial rigs we have, um, have a much uh, sparser set of input images. So the baseline between the images is much greater. So um, you struggle just by uh, using implicit uh, correspondences. So what, what, what the current state of the art is, OK, you have, for instance, this Google rig, and you stitch together this uh, 360 image, um, but there's no motion parallax. And now, for instance, what Anna proposed is like, yeah, how can, like, we need geometry, basically, to make it work for, uh, um, for, for, for these commercial uh, videos. So I would actually like to talk more about, uh, about this with Anna. Um, but, I mean, the main emphasis on this project is really to make this technology available to everyone. Like, the, the way we, we are capturing photos at the moment, why can't we just capture content which is usable in VR, right? And, yeah, that's what I can say. <laughs> and uh, if there are no other questions, you can thank the speaker again. <laughs>